that's still in the making and uh, sometimes in the making in ways that need to be contested, that need to be challenged, that we need to be involved in in many different ways. Sure. That's also part of the work of, of being citizens um, of, of, of a region, of, of a planet. I think increasingly as we begin to think about belonging, not just um, not just um, in terms of a very uh, close sense of nation. I think Tagore was one of the most important thinkers for, for, for insisting on a human understanding of belonging, one that, that transcended uh, the narrow bounds of nation um, and, um, some, and, and a figure that we really need to uh, recuperate for thinking about how we move forward in a in a uh, rather troubled human world right right can so can i just come in very yeah, quickly on yeah, something yeah. that both of you said which kind of made me think um, I think it's interesting because I think, you know, someone said to me that, you know, both the, the partition narratives in the official narratives in both Pakistan and India are very particularly informed by the nation, you know, the, the nation state project. And I think looking back on my own study as a, as a student in Bangladesh in terms of history, partition actually is not a very political subject for us. The history is more or less neutral, as neutral as history gets in that sense. What I think perhaps because 1971 was a more recent and a huge trauma for us, I think that's part of it. But I think also because um, the, you know, there's a lot of work, as you've said, that's been done on the Punjab side, on, on that side of partition, a bit less on the Bengal side. And I, and I wonder, I think it would be interesting to see what comes out of there in future. But one of the things that I'm, I'm always left with is that you know, despite everything, the regional tensions and the sort of national rhetoric and whatever, even today, when you put East Bengalis and West Bengalis in the same room, there's very little friction. There is much more uh, commonality from the language, from the food. You know, there's a lot of exchange and so on. And I wonder if that's also partly informed by the partition experience being, it was grotesque, of course, but it was somewhat less grotesque, perhaps, than what happened on the Western border. Yeah. So I'll come back to Srijit. Uh, on the issue of statelessness and, and how that played in your film? Uh, first of all, a brief, very brief preamble. Uh, this is the first time I'm speaking at a lit meet. Uh, thank you, Malavika. Thank you, Ratnavi. Thanks to all of you. Uh, lit meet, meet for me is pretty much like a tri visit tournament organized by scholarly Hogwarts. And in that <laughs> context, I'm pretty much a muggle and I have a very lowly MPhil from JNU, that to environmental economics and I feel very, very nervous and uh, uh, honored at the same time to be speaking the same stage. Uh, but yes, uh, being a product of uh, the subcontinent, if I may put it that way, uh, one can't escape the personal memory ramifications, all the historical perspective of partition, which touches you at some point of time in your life. As uh, Farah was saying, I am foolishly sentimental about my Purba Bongo roots, uh, Moin Moin Shingo and Bikrampur. So Nothing foolish about it. You're most <laughs> welcome to come for a visit. So, so whenever I go to Dhaka, and I went there a couple of times, I made sure I paid a visit. Obviously, nothing is left. Uh, but I managed to get back a bit of soil from both places, Mohamed Shingo and Bikrampur, uh, at the risk of uh, being labeled an anti-national. So, uh, but I did it nevertheless. And uh, so it kind of enters your world, the memories, the stories, the history of partition. And obviously, uh, it did enter mine as well, uh, initially through textbooks where only what mattered is what uh, Nehru thought or what Jinnah said and uh, how uh, the committee met and how uh, a certain Cyril Ratcliffe sat with a certain Lord Mountbatten and uh, history of the subcontinent and drew lines across a 5,000 year old civilization. So as ridiculous as that. Uh, and it is that sense of ridicule, uh, apart from the marginal woman bit, which I'll come to in a while, it is that sense of ridicule which Raj Kahini uh, operates on. Uh, just the notion of the riots, the, the, the pain, the trauma came later. First, the act. 
the act of dividing a subcontinent hastily in a period of five weeks, five weeks is what uh, Cyril Ratcliffe got to draw two lines across the map. And uh, having zilch topographical or demographical knowledge about uh, any of the nations, just having a very brief idea of the uh, religious uh, majority and minority distribution. So purely on the basis of that, uh, these two lines were drawn. And uh, when I was I was uh, doing some research on uh, the thing for Rajkahini, I came across some startling facts. Uh, my my main uh, reference was Joya Chatterjee, uh, Spoils of Partition, and Urvashi Butalia, The Other Side of Silence, and uh, another uh, Partition of Memories by Suvir Kaul. These were the three books which I majorly. So, the startling facts which I came across uh, were that they were actually bargaining for the pieces of the history of our land uh, in the uh, court proceedings which went on uh, in the month of uh, July uh, 1947, where each one was coming up with a wish list that this is the map of, uh, this should be the map of East Bengal and West Bengal, and uh, similarly for uh, Punjab. and with so the Hindu Mahasabha had one wish list. The Congress had a Congress scheme and then a Congress plan. Then the Muslim League had uh, thoughts of its own that how the map should look like. So eventually there was full on bargaining happening for little provinces, little chunks, uh, little I say from their perspective. But when the line was actually declared, uh, we saw widespread protests from various provinces some of which were confused whether they were in Pakistan or India. Uh, Khulna was one such province. Murshidabad, which initially thought that because of its uh, Muslim majority, it would fall under Pakistan. Three days after independence, they realized, oh no, we are, we are in India. So all sorts of uh, ridiculous, as, as, as I said, the word was nothing short of ridiculous. So that happened, and that sense of uh, utter disregard for human property, lives, history, sentiment is what led to the possibly one of the greatest tragedies uh, of mankind. I mean, I'm, when I was again looking at the literature on partition, as in I am not talking about the, the academic literature, which is quite voluminous, but the popular literature, you're talking about stories and novels and even films. So the way uh, the West has looked upon Holocaust and the way they have they have drilled the memory of Holocaust in, in, into each and every person today. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just share an anecdote. There was this friend of mine uh, seeing a person, uh, and uh, when that person introduced was introduced to a few uh, German students in England they kind of were taken aback. Uh, so my friend, Param uh, Broto, he said he didn't understand what happened. Then later they realized the word swastika has a certain uh, you know, uh, kind of trauma associated. And the word Führer, the word Reich, the word Auschwitz, the word, so these are words which a German kid would uh, you know, uh, really be repelled with. So that is the kind of collective consciousness which has been drilled into the Western world thanks to the, uh, you know, uh, so many films, so much of literature, so much of exposure to the event. Unfortunately, we have always, uh, I think, looked away, brushed things under the carpet, uh, said that yes, uh, certain things happened, those were bad things, let's move ahead. But the point is, as you said, partition and its aftermath, happens every day. So be it Godra, be it, you look at any any communal uh, riot or any uh, tragedy of that nature, one can actually trace back uh, this entire exercise to who was the first one? Who sent the first train? Was it Amritsar bound or was it Lahore bound, which carried all the dead bodies? So these are questions which kind of can be traced back to the partition itself. So 
therein lies the first element of Rajkahini, which deals with the frivolous nature in which the event happened. And the second bit, as you said, it's about the marginal uh, women. And there again, uh, as I was reading Urvashi Butali, as I was reading Joya Chatterjee, I understood that the concept of honor is, is uh, again, it's a very male concept, but it was uh, kind of such that the only way to desecrate or violate the other country was to violate its women. Yeah. And then in that sphere, possibly the the high society, the elitist, the, the, the uh, upper, upper class women were still spared, but the marginal women were even more vulnerable because they did not have that extra uh, social cushion, so as to speak. So the plight, the, the trauma of what these women went through is something which put me under severe depression. Uh, I went into a depression after reading up for Raj Kahin and I could not pen a line for a very long time. And I had to really push myself and counsel myself because the accounts of the riots, the kind of atrocities which were committed on women, the graphic details of those uh, those those horror stories uh, are uh, pretty much documented in a number of books. There is one a book called Towards Freedom, which is a collection of uh, editorials and letters which were sent to the uh, editors of famous uh, newspapers during that time. So you read those letters and you understand the level of inhumanity. I mean, there is violence and there is bloodshed and there is, but what happened during those riots, let's say Noah Khali riot, or I mean, the 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 the, the 1946 uh, cleansing uh, after Surawadi's address in Kolkata. Uh, so the level of inhumanity is something which is which would shake uh, even the strongest of hearts. Right. And when I was writing Raj Kahini. Somewhere that was kind of a shared experience. Somewhere, possibly in my blood, uh, the 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 chronological memory of that violence possibly remained somewhere. Uh, I had heard stories from my friends, their their fathers, their grandfathers, my own family, but to read that in black and white and then having to imagine it. Obviously, if you have to put something on screen, you will have to imagine it first yourself. Then possibly you go to an actor or a you tell him or her, this is how you do it. Then you tell the cinematographer, this is how you shoot it. But you have to see the entire uh, riot in your head first. So when I went through that process, that kind of really I know, shook the living daylights out of me. And Raj Kahini, in that sense, was a very, I don't know, possibly it was a very cathartic process for me. Because at the end of it all, when uh, uh, if I may call it, the redemption happened. Uh, I felt that there was things, there were things which were kind of uh, flowing out. Possibly it was rage, possibly it was agony, possibly it was trauma, but there was some kind of a catharsis. You know, you were talking about rape and the violence against women, and and you know, we have read a lot about women being abducted from both sides of the border. You know, when we hear the stories of abduction, we we are intrigued and we are curious as to whether the women, um, many women did not come, many women did not want to come. So, so what was the motivation behind the refusal of the women to come back, Farah? I think one of them would have been the sort of wider construction we have in this part of the world around honor and chastity and purity and contamination on the other side of it. So I think, and we see that actually even today, if you see how rape survivors are treated, if you see how families deal with these kind of issues, that, that profound shame and the concept of family honor being tied in with the status of the woman is, is still part of our, all of our cultures, I think, in that sense. So if you look at the fact that those women were taken, okay, so they were taken, they were abduct, uh, abducted, they were raped, many of them were forced into marriage, they had children. When they were then recovered, as that uh, operation was known, what were they being recovered to? They were being brought back to their families who were deeply ashamed and traumatized and horrified by what had happened. They were leaving behind children 
you know, which is a, uh, must have been fantastically traumatic, and some kind of you know, rehabilitation of some sorts in some of those cases within those families where they were married, they'd converted. It was some kind of a life. You know? So to leave that and to come back into a situation of basically being, I think, in many cases, a pariah. And there are even, there are even uh, you know, there's a lot of literature on the fact that uh, a number of those women ended up in ashrams after returning yeah. because the families couldn't cope with it. So, so, but, but, but the partition literature has not engaged with, with the issue of consent of women, right? So there is a large amount of silence around there. And Wazira, could there be also the love angle? Could, could there be that the women fell in love with the abductors, so they didn't want to leave their... Pinger is a film which deals with such no, a... No, I'm not talking about films. I'm talking yeah, in real but, terms. Yes, but... Uh, could it be a possibility? Films and literature even Manto, for example, it yeah. draws a lot from uh, real it life does. incidents. Even like the abduction bit, uh, Rajkani begins with Koldo, which is a case of an uh, abduction. So there were abductions happening, uh, happening where the honor of the chastity angle came in, which is why they didn't return. Obviously, there was this Stockholm complex, if you Syndrome. may, yeah, if you may kind of call it. And of course, there was also this uh, 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 thing about the role these wo volunteers played, because that was also a very crucial thing. That that uh, there was a lot of uh, gender politics which happened there also, because a lot of uh, cases the volunteers who rescued eventually turned persecutors themselves, and uh, so that scenario became very very complicated in terms of the woman coming back to the families and everything. Yeah. So uh, that 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 silence, I do I, I think. If you delve deep, if you look into the letters, the letters mm -hmm. which, which kind of record the personal histories mm -hmm. rather than the political mm -hmm. one, you will find many such incidents where there are mentions of such uh, cases where the woman is returning or not returning, mm -hmm. citing uh, mm -hmm. cases either way. And so, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say that I think enough work on women has not been done, period, right? Oh. So there's the silence on that. And the work that has been done, I feel, is still done with, from this very uh, conventional framework of victim and oppressed. And what that does is it takes a voice away from women further. So then you have the Indian state and the Pakistani state saying, oh, the women are so oppressed. They are too oppressed to even make a choice. So we must decide on their behalf. Of course, they want to come back. Or of course, they do not want to come back. And in many cases, I feel these kind of um, you know frameworks just remove the agency of women, remove the women, period, from the equation. So we have not studied consent. I don't, and I don't think we can study consent if we continue to see them from these angles of men were the oppressors, women were always oppressed. You know? There were also instances where women were the oppressors. You, know, you had other kind of issues like mother-in-law, daughter-in-law issues also coming in. Women also kind of uh, um, absorbing the structural patriarchal stereotypes of honor. Right? Yeah. So saying that we would rather kill ourselves now, was it really them deciding that or was it men deciding on their behalf? I don't really think we have done enough work or we have been able to do that kind of work to really recover those voices. Uh, there's been some, or Vishi has, of course, done a lot of wonderful work on that, but just not enough. Yeah. So, Wazira, when we look at um, women during partition, we see that they were engaged a lot in rehabilitation work, working at the camps, which Anam's grandmother uh, was engaged in. Do you think that this has a gender impact where, where women, and if they were working also as state agents? Well, I mean, we do have uh, some memoirs of women who, uh, written by women who were involved in the refugee rehabilitation work, particularly um, uh, with the recovery program. And they are very uh, uncertain, very ambiguous about what they're doing. They, they did once they were on, you know, there was, there was this plan, there was this uh, set of uh, there was a program, but but they were interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis, and they were very troubled by um, forcing women. Um, they were uncertain about what was going on. 
And those memoirs are a very rich source, I think uh, a very important source we have for getting at the experiences of women um, um, from that time. I think they, they were very important interlocutors between the state and, 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 and uh, women um, on the ground. Um, this, this, this word victim and oppressed uh, an oppressor has come up. So I just want to say, um, you know, thinking about all of us being all of us being victims or or having sort of shared suffering, in a way, uh, um, maybe flattens out the the very different kinds of experiences people have had. We have to also remember. I mean, one of the reasons why. Uh, it has taken so long for a body of writing on partition to even emerge has been because, you know, at, for every victim of violence, uh, men or women, there were perpetrators of violence amongst us. So um, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, uh, it's a, it, it was a kind of violence that happened um, um, you know, within lived communities, people living side by side together. We have uh, other examples um, across the 20th century where where that kind of thing happened. Um, the Holocaust being being sort of very important because so much writing and thought has gone into that. Uh, when neighbors turn against each other, when friends and 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 lovers turn against each other. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and yeah, we, we have a long way to, I mean, we've only the last couple of decades begun to really even talk about, write about, and so I think we, we really need a lot more reflection on, um, on this question of, uh, of the nature of this violence, understanding the nature of this violence. There are many words that, that get used, genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, civil war, um, and, and we don't know what what set of words to use. I mean, different writers use different words, and I think that already tells us a little bit about the unsettled nature, how how difficult this still remains to think and write about. Uh, we don't have a clear cut vocabulary because it isn't clear cut. Um, and I think we, if we were to probe and reflect on what on on the many different experiences of partition, including one of um, genocidal violence um, and 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 violence against women, we might have some. I, I think it requires philosophical work. It requires psychological work. It requires a lot of thinking on many different registers. But we might have something to 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 to, to give to. The experience of not just the 20th century, but but something to contribute to thinking.